Okay, we'll, we'll bring the music down. It's actually 9 o'clock, and, and we don't want to miss a, a second of this opportunity with Carol, because Carol is a, a fount of wisdom, and she... I'm trying to get the music. Music's out of control. <laughs> Uh, just as an introduction, let me say that, um, as I said last night, I met Carol, Carol Howe in the, I think it was the early 1990s, and she just graciously invited me into her home. And then more recently, um, Jason and I were down in Florida, and uh, we called up Carol, and we arranged to meet at a Starbucks, and... Um, Jason was so touched, as he mentioned last night. He, he was looking across, and, and I affectionately, when we go around and meet people who have been in the course for many years, I, I affectionately call it the Legends Tour. I take some of the, my friends, uh, come on with me on the Legends Tour. We're going to go visit the Lucketts in Honolulu. We're going to visit Carol Howe. And so he's got in, in his mind, oh, the Legends Tour, and she's going to meet us at Starbucks. And, and then... Uh, as we sat down and had the initial meetings, Jason's just, his eyes are big because Carol's sitting right across from him, and Carol reaches out and takes his hands in his arms, and, sa- and he says, I'm, I'm Jason. She says, I know, I've been following you on the internet for many years. And <laughs> his eyes were just like... <laughs> It's like looking into Yoda's eyes and having Yoda say, I've been following you for many years. And he's like, oh. <laughs> but uh, Carol is, is just an amazing teacher and so, so, so practical. You know, her work with people comes down to the practical application of this. So it's one thing to have a grasp of the teachings and the metaphysics, but we actually have a, a healing experience when we put it into practice and and that's what Carol has been doing all these years and when I first met her it was in her house she just opened up and naturally started sharing these wonderful encounters that she had with Bill because I was quite curious I had read a lot about Helen but Bill was was kind of a mystery mm-hmm. and not after I spent the time with Carol mm-hmm. Bill was no longer a mystery he was the co-scribe and he was the co he was the collaborator in every way and so that was very touching for me and very inspiring because we have to be inspired to follow our calling and I just want to thank you for your life, your dedication, and your inspiration. And uh, this can be a, a morning chat like we had with uh, Judy, just to sure. ask questions, myself or anyone here. And um, maybe we'll just open it up so you can start by just sharing what's on your heart this morning. Well, as we mentioned earlier, a few of us were talking at breakfast, it's like, I love what I do so much that if somebody said, you will never be paid another cent in your life for anything, it's like, fine with me. It's like, this is delicious. People say, don't you ever get tired of saying the same thing over and over and over again? It's like, no, it's fun to say because you're connecting with people and it's a new experience every time. So even though the information is the same, the connection is unique and different and precious every time. So I don't think there's anything in the world more exciting than watching people get it. You know, watching people's either either I can hear it in their voice when I do over the phone counseling, which I do a lot of, or in person, you know, to watch a face relax, you know, watch the shoulders drop like I'm okay. You know, it's it's just the most wonderful thing in the world. Yeah. And Bill was wonderful at that. I would presume that a lot of you have many misconceptions about Bill, if you have any conceptions at all. Because sometimes with literature that's out there, you might think of, well, Bill was the helper typist person in the corner, you know, who helped out. (laughs) Nothing could be further from the truth. So may I presume that you would like to know a little bit of firsthand experience about what Bill was like? 
Yeah. Yeah. Fair to say. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> First of all, we talked, or Judy talked about commitment last night, you know, being absolutely essential in any, everything we do. Well, on the, I, I became a student of a course 40 years ago in 1977, not long after it was initially published. And gradually over that time, collected enough people to be a little study group uh, with a friend of mine and so on and so forth. And then that summer of 19... Um, uh, the summer, things continued to unfold. The next spring of 1978, I get this humanistic psychology brochure saying that at a university in Denver, where I lived at the time, Judy Scutch, she was Judy Scutch at the time, and Bill Fetford were going to be presenting. Well, I would have crawled across Denver on my hands and knees, if necessary, to meet these people because I was so enchanted with the course. Aside from raising my kids, nothing was more important at that point than being intimately involved with this material. So we go out, my husband and I go out there, and what the brochure failed to say was that they were going to set it up outside. They had an outdoor stage set up, and the brochure said Judy would speak. She's a fabulous speaker, as you no doubt gathered last night, and that Bill would be there, although he wouldn't speak. Okay, still, anybody related to the course I definitely wanted to have some experience with. And so this was nuts not to say in the brochure that it was going to be outside because Denver... In, the, in May is cold outside at night, so we didn't go prepared for anything outside. So we sat through about an hour and a half of Judy's marvelous presentation, and because I was unprepared for the cold, I finally thought, I'm freezing to death, and I'm just going to have to get up and go find the first building I can find and open the door and go inside. So I did. And guess what I found? I found, standing over in a corner by himself, not another soul in this big room, is this tall, handsome man. And I thought, that is Bill Thetford. There weren't any pictures of him around at that point. You know, there's no internet. There's no any way that any that kind of information can be shared. So I walked up to him. Sure enough, it was. And I had an experience the likes of which I had never had before. And so there, since it's a nonverbal experience, I have no words, but I will point to them, which was the deepest sense of recognition and connection with any human being I had ever met. I, who am never speechless, was almost speechless. <laughs> it's like hardly knew what to say. Well, about 10 minutes later, apparently everybody else was freezing as well. The doors opened and a stampede of people came in and so that was the end of the conversation. And I just pondered over this very unusual experience. Now, 40 years ago, I'd had a whole lot less experience than I've had now. So that was just really quite remarkable. And so someone called me a few months later saying, did you know that Bill Thetford and the Scutches have moved to California to Tiburon. And I thought, I, had, I have no idea where Tiburon is, but okay, like so, and file that away. A couple of months later, my, my teaching partner and very dear friend Jason said, I'm going to Tiburon for advanced work. And I thought, well, what a non-coincidence is this, that all of a sudden this focus is on Tiburon. And so I thought, well, I'm going to write a letter to this person with whom I had a 10-minute encounter and as a letter of introduction to Jason. Now, at that time, I had no idea what an introvert Bill is, how unlike it is for him to do any reaching out of any kind and wanting to see strange people or anything like that. I mean, he, after all, he's a 10-minute acquaintance <laughs> and nothing is written about him. Nobody knows anything about him. And I thought, well, I'll just send this letter to the Foundation of Inner Peace, and if it gets there, it gets there, because where else will I send this? Well, on Halloween afternoon, I'm getting my little kids ready to go out for the evening. The phone rings long before caller ID. 
It's Bill Thetford <clears throat> with his beautiful voice. If you don't know, Bill had a gorgeous voice. It had a very beautiful healing quality to it. It was a bass voice. And just hearing him talk was enough to just kind of captivate people. So here's his beautiful voice on the phone. He said, yes, I would be happy to meet your friend. And are you going to come out too? And it's like, this is getting weirder and weirder all the time. <laughs> so at first I said, because I was much more into being a polite Southern girl at that time. I've outgrown a lot of that happily. <laughs> so, and asking for what I want and saying yes when I mean yes and no when I mean no. And the ne I said, well, no, this was just a letter of introduction for Jason. The next morning I thought... <laughs> what do I mean no? I mean, it was like an invitation like this. And I, so we made the arrangements. And in November of 1978, I went out and, and Jason found me a place to stay with a friend of his and get this. It's like where Judy and Bob lived is here. About a block away is where Jerry Jampolsky lived. About a block and a half away is where Bill Thetford lived. And this girl's house that I stay with is a few blocks away. Like, and you know what the name of that street was? Paradise Drive. <laughs> so all of these marvelous people are living on the water on Paradise Drive. So um, we spent many, many hours. So Jason and Bill and I spent many hours together. He introduced us to Jerry. And I just had this continued amazing feeling of the family is coming back together. That was the strongest sense of all. And one evening, Jason and I met only with Bob and Judy. And as we were getting acquainted, Judy, in her very effervescent way, as you were able to note last night, said, I know why you're here. It's like, by this time, I'm sort of, the whole thing is surreal as far as I'm concerned. Like, I cannot believe I'm here with these people. And, and she said, I'm going to bequeath you Bill. Bill has worked so hard, and she was kind of saw herself as his caretaker or something like that. So she said, Bill has worked so hard for these past 20 years or so, and he needs to be socialized. And so I'm giving you Bill. It's like, I had never been bequeathed a person before, like, especially a person of this stature. So Bill and I continued to become very dear friends, and he would come visit us in um, Denver with my husband and two little boys, and I would go stay with him, and sometimes with Jerry, and sometimes with Bill, and my husband was not alarmed because Bill is a gay man, so he didn't have to be concerned about that, and, and my husband loved him as well, as did my little kids, so it was just an amazing opportunity to see him up close sort of with his hair down, and only after I got to know him did I realize what an astounding stretch this was. I mean, I don't know if you've studied much about introvert and extrovert uh, qualities, but very private introvert people don't call up a strange woman and invite them to come out for a few days. I mean, that is about as out of character for somebody like Bill as you could possibly imagine. So you can see that there was a divine hand in all this. There was like a really big divine hand in this because the whole situation was so unlikely. So we continued to stay in touch uh, specifically those first um, two and a half years or so. And on a few occasions, Bill and Jerry and I and a fourth person um, did day-long workshops for the University of California in various locations. And uh, Jerry especially wanted me to come along because Bill would try to wiggle out of this. He hated to speak in front of people, but he said, if you will come along, then I can be assured that Bill will show up. <laughs> and we captured him in the car so he couldn't leave anyway. But in any event, 
the qualities about Bill were amazing. First of all, he was the, about the most unassuming person I've ever met. I had no idea from what he had to say in those first two or th- actually the first two or three years that he was actually a very famous psychologist in his own right. Even if he had never had a thing to do with A Course in Miracles, he was highly regarded in his field. He was considered one of the very top experts in this personality assessment system that he had worked on for so many years and was called upon in difficult situations. They, they were just at the top of their game in the whole psychological world, shall we say, in the United States. Well, who knew? You know, he isn't going to talk about that. He rarely ever talked about himself. Once or twice, he really allowed himself to kind of unload, and I had a chance to really find out some of the amazing things he had done and that he was known for. The other thing that I absolutely would want anybody to know is that just like you have to have a man and a woman to produce a child, you had to have Bill's energy and Helen's energy in order to unlock what was latent and what they both recognized that they had agreed to do. It didn't take them long once they got started to realize they made this commitment before they came. Whatever before they came means they were clear that at all costs, this was a commitment that they intended to keep. So as tumultuous as it was, they kept their word. They were people of incredible integrity. So Bill, being very humble, it took me a few years to realize, oh my gosh, look who it is I'm, I'm dealing with here. <laughs> and on one occasion, after I'd started doing these six-week overview classes of the course in Denver, Bill would come out, and and some of these our classes were on a Thursday night, and we'd say, well, do you want to wait at home for us to finish, or do you want to come to the class? And he would say, I want to come to the class, but don't tell anybody who I am. <laughs> so, and they were long classes. They were like from 7.30 to 10, and we had a break in the middle, and sometimes people would want to stay longer than that. So I said, okay, I won't tell anybody who you are, but I guarantee someone will find out. I think Bill did not appreciate his presence and the fact that his presence was so felt and so available and so healing and his voice was so healing. Well, as one has one new stretching occasion after the other, teaching a class with here are all the rest of the students and Bill Fetford in the middle of A Course in Miracles class was just too bizarre. So sure enough, People would, it was like you could see his, you could feel his light shining, so it's, anyway, it was very strange, and so sure enough, people would come up to him, this happened more than once, would come up to him in the middle of our break and start to ask him questions, and I knew that if somebody asked him something outright, he would not lie about it. In other words, nobody was going to say anything, but if the questioning got to be specific, you know, and they and they drilled down on him. So sure enough, everyone knew before the class was over with. Finally, it was like, see, I told you so. It's like, you can't hide your light. And certainly he couldn't. He was a very funny guy. Tammy knows. Those of you who ever met him know what a funny guy he was. And he also had a way, if people came to town, now between Judy, Tammy's mother, and Jerry Jampolsky, there was a parade of people through Tiburon from all over the world who wanted to hang out with one or the other of them, or both, because Jerry had established his Center for Attitudinal Healing, and Judy, of course, was, was shepherding forward of the Foundation for Inner Peace, and you know, periodically they would hand people over to Bill that particularly <laughs> needed something, or if they just needed to have that person not be with them for a while. <laughs> so Bill had this kind of interesting role going on, and and if somebody got to be a little too self-important, you probably remember this, Tammy or Bob, he would have a way of. He never 
put anybody down, but he just had a way of lightening things up, and it was impossible under some of these circumstances to look at him and keep a straight face because he'd sit there and he'd make he could wiggle one ear. You know, he could sit there like this, and one ear would wiggle, and he's like. So, so there were there were times I'm sure you remember that where there would be kind of like a little inside joke. Nobody else, none of these other visiting dignitaries, would have any idea what was going on. But you and everybody who knew him well had this experience. You couldn't look at each other because you knew that you both would start laughing in the most totally inappropriate way. So he had this a certain kind of lightness and irreverence. He just wouldn't let you take things seriously. Hugh Prather used to say, it's impossible to take the course seriously and be somber about it the way Bill would talk about it. In the early days, when he still lived in New York, somebody, some new course student, discovered where he lived in Manhattan and came to his door and knocked on the door. Bill answered and said, this man said, I am a new student of The Course in Miracles, and the Holy Spirit told me that I was supposed to find you and ask you for $10,000. And, <laughs> and without missing a beat, Bill said, the Holy Spirit spoke with me to let me know you would be coming and said I was not to give it to you. <laughs> It's like he could just come up with stuff right on the spot. So he's he's truly this very holy, amazing man. Some people were healed in his presence by nothing other than just being in his presence, which embarrassed him no end. And he didn't know quite what to do when this happened, but nevertheless it happened. So he was he was brilliant, he was very funny, he had this amazing healing quality about him. And I would wish more than anything in the world that every course student could have experienced him, which is one reason I had to write his book, because nobody knew who he was, what he was like, the absolutely critical and essential part that he played without Bill, this would not have happened, and none of us would be here. Because this was not just that he held Helen's hand when she was trying to do her dictating, which he did. I'm sure you all know that. She coughed, sputtered, cried, lost her voice, and everything else, because what she was saying to him was so distressing. So not only was he compassionate, with her plight, not only was he greatly helpful, but at that energetic level, which is where things happen, they made a promise, and on that famous occasion that Judy mentioned last night, which was they were sick and tired of the way their meetings were being conducted, and they were going off to a meeting that they hated going to. And that's when the little, there's got to be a better way than this speech occurred. <laughs> and, and a little part that's not included in that is that he said, you know, we're going to have to do things differently other than um, t kind of telling people what to do and making, oh, he said, we're going to go into this meeting and we're not going to make anybody wrong. And I thought, well, no wonder you hated your meetings if your goal was to go into a meeting and make everybody in there wrong. I can see why this would not be a satisfactory situation. So in any event, they they learned and learned and learned. And, and when I met him, he was just moving to California for his last 10 years. And People would come up to him, I wish you could have seen this, and they would say, well, Bill, like I would have the first couple of times I was there, he agreed that I could have a big reception and invite all the course people I knew to come meet him. I only did that once because I knew meeting with a whole bunch of people was like his most unfavorite thing to do, but he said yes, he would do it. So after that, it was only meeting with one or two. But I was with him on a number of occasions where people, you know, trying to make small talk or something would say, well, now that you're retired, what are you doing now? And he would say, practicing forgiveness, which was pretty much a conversation stopper for most people. <laughs> but a few would persevere, like, well, 
like, <laughs> what are you really doing? Or what does that mean? Or something like that. That wasn't a smart aleck answer on his part. This, he recognized that letting go of his grievances was job one, and as far as he was concerned, really the only job. Everything else was kind of peripheral and around the edges. And he succeeded, he succeeded, he succeeded. He became lighter, more joyful, more amazingly wonderful and and brilliant in every way. And as Judy mentioned last night, um, by the time he left, he was literally up on his tiptoes. And wit, our military guy, who was not given to hyperbole, agreed. He said he had never, ever seen Bill like that. And indeed, he was up on his tiptoes. He just literally almost could no longer be earthbound Mm -hmm. as he was kind of on his way out, so to speak. So anyway, that's just like a really short version of this amazing man. And so if you have any questions at all, please do ask. Do what? Put some sun on your legs. Oh, that's no problem. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> have a microphone there if anyone does have a question before they come up, or Kristen, she's ask them. Or maybe Tammy's got things to add that she I would love to have a question. Right to the mic. Oh, yeah. the mic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure Tammy's got knows things I don't know about Bill, since of course she knew him from the time she was a teenager. Very different things because I knew him as a teenager. Yeah. And not as an adult to yeah. adult. But I did want to say um, the story I'm sure you know uh, when you were talking about how Bill would bring levity when um, two people were really struggling over a part in the course and I don't remember what part but I'm sure my mother would be able to say and I came to Bill and, and asked him what he thought mm-hmm. and he took, he opened the book, he mm-hmm. ripped out the page and said mm-hmm. done. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> he had that way. I yes. just wanted to add to that. Yes, I have a lot of other stories, but I would love for people to ask questions. But I just wanted to say yes. how irreverent. I loved that about Bill. Yes. His irreverence um, because he was the real deal. Yes. And yes. Yeah, he could bring humor underneath everything. He yes. would say things that if. As a teenager, I wasn't interested in what everyone was talking about in the course. Um, But to hear his little side comments under his breath, I would sit next to him just to listen. And he (laughs) had me laughing straight through, which was very similar to Bob Scutch. Yes. Bob did the same. Yeah. So I just wanted to add that. That's great. No, people could not, Bill would not get a solemn, serious look on his face. And strangely enough, Um, of of all the time we were together, we hardly ever talked about the content of the course. Um, He was interested in, literally, in being socialized. When he would come to my house, my little boys at that time were five and seven. Well, he thought just watching little kids was fascinating. He was never around little kids. You know, when he was young, you may or may not know that his he came from um, a, a, a middle class family minus, so to speak, and his father worked for the telephone company or something, and his mom was a stay at home mom like everybody was in those days, and the family belonged to the Christian Science Church. However, the first child they had died in infancy. And that left, uh, and then a daughter was born, and then a couple years later, Bill was born. And Bill adored this older sister more than life itself, and followed her around like a puppy dog, and loved to play with her and her little girlfriends and whatever they did. And when she was seven, she, or when he was seven, uh, and she was nine, she got some little strep throat or something that is normally a non-issue for kids, and she died. And this was shocking to Bill. His dearest friend and playmate in the whole world was suddenly, without warning, taken out of his life. And 
he confessed in many ways, late obviously as an adult and when I knew him, that he always thought his father loved that daughter more. And he said, you know, kind of the way Bill thought he was being looked at, notice we all experience whatever we experience and not necessarily what the other person is or isn't doing. But for years, he labored under the horrible idea that his father somehow wished he had died rather than the little girl and and felt so guilty kind of the survivor's guilt kind of thing that it was that so he had a very contentious relationship with his father for a very very long time which it's very hard for me to imagine I'm a parent that this had anything to do with Bill was even on this man's mind at his daughter's funeral. I mean, he's busy grieving for his daughter, not somehow wishing that some other arrangement had occurred. I mean, that's not what happens when you're grieving over a child. So that was much of what Bill had to deal with as he as he moved through his learning stages. Because Bill helped to bring the course forward did not give him a free pass. He just didn't get to hop up to the top of the line. Because what happened to him after about six months after this little girl died, he felt so sick at heart over this that he made himself very sick with scarlet fever, rheumatic fever, and was in bed for two years. Can you imagine a little boy in bed two years? No television, no video, no games, no nothing. He read books and laid in bed. And when he finally was over all of that, when he was nine years old, because he read and read and read and read and was very brilliant anyway, even as a little kid, they didn't know what to do with him in school. He was socially behind his age, but academically he was way above his age. And so they would kind of take him out of this grade and put him in this grade. And it was a very tumultuous, kind of imagine any of us, you know, with, with a, 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 a precious sister dying, then being sick for two years, and then having this odd growing up life because, like, where do I fit, so to speak? And then once he went off to college, and he had had a kind of a, he had a girlfriend of sorts. And when he was in college, he um, allowed himself to recognize that he was a gay man. Or, as he said very late in life, probably a bisexual man. But all of his private life was with men and never women. Although he loved women, including me, but he, his private life was with men. So if one thinks that he just got to sail through life and got to a place of joy at the end of his life because it was a big silk road laid in front of him, that would be a grave misconception. So I think it's crucial and important that in many ways he didn't know what he was doing. He felt like he kind of stumbled ahead. One thing that I think is funny related to the fact that he was a gay man, he worked for the CIA. Mm -hmm. And the CIA, at least at that time, did not permit gay people to be in the CIA. So people said, how did he manage that? Well, he had done so much with in, in testing with um, galvanic skin response and so on that he knew how to make the lie detector test do what he wanted it to do. <laughs> so don't underestimate anybody's ability to accomplish their task. <laughs> and, and perhaps a little divine intervention there. It was very clear that his path required that he be with the CIA. So it's like, whatever we have to do to get him into the CIA is what we're going to do. <laughs> That's it. And wit, too. Uh, Wasn't wit a, a, a general or something? Yeah, yeah. Yes, he was, he was not, a, he was right, uh, whatever is right underneath. Colonel, uh, cr colonel. Right underneath yeah. the colonel, so, um, yes. And in fact, Witt and Bill, Witt was, on, was the only one of Bill's friends who was intimately acquainted with this personality assessment system. So you have to also look at the weirdness of this. Here he is at Columbia. He's doing all of the myriad jobs he did at Columbia, plus 
over here surreptitiously he and Helen are getting together every morning and they're doing their scribing for years and years and then they're going through the editing and all the business related to that and over here he's doing research on this personality assessment system which is how the ego develops in the first place so is this schizophrenic or not so he's got his professional life is down to the last little intricate detail of how egos develop and on the other hand how all of that study of the ego is pointless and here's how you let it go <laughs> so. I think some of you can relate to this Everyone's, I see nodding heads like yeah pointless yeah, absolutely pointless <laughs> so after 20 years he gave up his research on the PAS but on the day he died on the 4th of July, 29 years ago, he and Witt, they loved to talk about this PAS because at the time and space worldly level, Bill thought the PAS still at that time remained the most outstanding uh, instrument for assessing what a person's personality was like and what they would do under any kind of stressful situation, which is what it was developed for in the first place. You know, what would people do under various circumstances? So on the very day he died, at this level, he's saying, this is a wonderful measurement for those who are still in the place where they need to have this measurement. But as far as he was concerned, he was over the whole thing. When he was, when the course was coming through, he, among other jobs that he had, at one point was being the co-editor of the Journal for Abnormal Psychology. And he thought it was hilarious that sometimes they would have to reject articles on the grounds that they were not sufficiently scientific. <laughs> this is while they're doing their very unscientific, you know, close the door, pull down the shades, and, <laughs> and do their course stuff. So anyway, just to let you know, Bill didn't get a pass. But when he said... I am practicing forgiveness. And he also didn't even, there were things about the course in the early days he didn't understand either. What do you think about that? <laughs> and in case you think, oh, I don't really understand what this says, he didn't either. I remember in one of the early days when he was at my house, I remember in the backyard, and I said, Bill, what is actually does this mean? I was a brand new student myself. What does this mean when it says forgiveness isn't real unless the, it brings a healing to your brother and yourself? And he said, I don't know. <laughs> well, that turns out to be like a really very central important thing. So it's important for everybody to know that even Bill himself, I, and I don't know about Helen, but at least Bill himself had to do the practicing before the understanding could come. The Course is very clear that says basically understanding joy and peace are a package deal. And if you're not feeling joyful and if you're not at peace, presume you understand nothing. That at least levels the playing field. So, and, and it's the reason yeah. why people feel so frustrated when they try to learn this course. It is not a course to be learned. It is a spiritual technology for rewiring your brain, for getting your, all of this unfortunate, this, we're speaking of it now at the time and space level, of course. And this, what happens is, as you do the practice, as you literally focus your attention on these more accurate ideas about yourself and our situation, you literally are changing. You're, you're growing new synapses in your brain, again, speaking of it from the time and space point of view. And the more you do that, and the clearer your mind becomes as you let go of the things you need to let go of, then it's very easy to understand. It's actually simple. Basically what it says, 
if you stop attacking yourself, you'll feel better. <laughs> like, really, is that what it says? <laughs> we make it very complicated, and that's because our minds are very fogged up. They're very unclear in a very literal way. It's like trying to look through a window that's all smeared up and it's foggy and it's got cobwebs on it and cracks through it. So everything is distorted. So the purpose of doing those lessons is that it slowly clears out your mind and you go, this is kindergarten stuff. This is very simple. But if you try to read it and learn it and understand it from our current mindset with that fogged up mind, you will just drive yourself crazy. You will just think this is written in some foreign language and not one sentence makes any sense. You know, people will say... By the time I get to end of this sentence, I don't know what the beginning of the sentence said. Well, don't worry about that. Practice it. That's what Bill did. He practiced. He dealt with the things that he needed to deal with. And as you probably know, one of his last biggest, by no coincidence, forgiveness issues was with Ken. Does that come as a surprise? Of course not. You know, it's like we're all brought together. And although Bill and Helen had some really very big difficulties getting along. Did you know that? Did you know Bill? (laughs) And in many ways, although Helen was, I suppose, happily married to Louie, comfortably married to Louie, she was in love with Bill. And this impossible situation of being so tied together over their joint child, so to speak, and yet being in a situation that could never come to any sort of resolution, so to speak. You can kind of see the cosmic setup for this. And in any event, that um, the thing that's interesting, as Judy said, is that when they uh, were dealing with the Course, they were compassionate, they were kind, they were very sweet with one another, and then the minute they went over to their academic work, it was back to bickering. They didn't scream and yell and fuss, or I mean, they weren't like that, but they just, I talked to Ken, I said, what in the world could they find to fight over so continuously? He said, he said I don't even know, and he said, and besides, it was the same thing, they would just recycle the same argument over and over and over and over and over and over, and over again. If you're going to argue that much, you pretty soon you run out of material. You have to go back to the beginning and <laughs> bring up some old issues and deal with those. So it was um, a, a, a difficult situation. And when, so despite that, they were very close. You know, at that real fundamental level, they were they were a hundred percent committed to one another. And when Ken dropped into the mix in 1973, at that point, Bill and Helen had partially edited the work. And they had stopped because they were sick and tired of it, not because it was finished. Hear that. Not because it was finished, but because they were both busy, they were tired, they needed to take a break. And it was at that point that that Ken's life Um, became intertwined with theirs. And Helen and Ken established their own very close relationship, which on the one hand was a big relief for Bill. You know, it's like she's got something else to occupy a lot of her time so that he didn't have to be the object all the time. But at the same time, he felt very left out and very rejected by this situation and he used to say this was in his he long since got over this but in he was recounting what it was like for him in the early times he said well first of all as you may or may not know the Ken you know after all this is Jesus's work and here is Helen as his mom you know bringing this course forward so he spoke with her with that same kind of reverence, shall we say, accorded Mary. And, I mean, he didn't pretend like Helen was Mary, but you could kind of see the situation there. And Helen would say to Bill, Ken is 
I don't know any saint that's more beatific than Ken. Well, this fell on Bill's ears with something less than, you know, he wasn't thrilled with any of this. And so he would say somewhat sarcastically, yes, I would have lunch every day with the Virgin Mary and the world's greatest saint. <laughs> which was, which was. Tamara's got something. There. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> if this happens again, Kristen will just bring the mark, mic to your blanket. Well, <laughs> just just to add to that, in the the psycho dynamics yeah. of it, and it was psycho, I promise. You. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> From a teenager perspective, oh, yes. it was very psycho. Yes. Um, <laughs> It, it was it was Helen's way of getting back at Bill for not being in love with her. Yes, in return. absolutely. And she did she did say at a time to my mother, "Do you know I would have left Louis and everything for Bill if he wanted me?" Yes. And their arrangement was so intriguing for me as a teenager to mm-hmm. watch all this because I could also see things clearly. I was given a certain gift that way yeah. to see that Bill had actually... I mean, here these two people were working together, and it had to be what you could... The word used around is karmic, because yes. Bill actually had a room built for Helen and Louis at his Fire Island home, and Fire Island is a very gay community, yes. and he included her in on everything yeah. in the deepest way that he could without partnering yes. with her, and my feeling about it with Helen in a psycho mm. way was that what kept her involved in listening was because she could have a special relationship with Bill for Absolutely. those years. Yes. privately, intimately, yes. and that was their relationship. So yes. everything was orchestrated mm-hmm. within the personality yes. to do this. So for Bill and Witt to be so interested in the PAS, the personality assessment system, mm-hmm. it was because Holy Spirit used the personality in order to birth this. And it's what Absolutely. made me, as a kid who was in New York, who also had a healthy skepticism, mm-hmm. say, this is the real deal. Yeah. Um, so it wasn't a holier than now. I watched Helen like take her little dagger, as in Psycho, to do this drill all the time as he sat there and under his breath whispered the under the neath dagger. Yeah. And it was, and then, and then you know, Ken was just adoring and you know couldn't even speak because he stuttered and stammered. That yeah. just served Helen, and mm-hmm. the dynamics were pretty extraordinary. So and, I just wanted to add and, and that. so when, and when we and that's perfect. And when we get in our dynamics. Then, you, as we all do, you know, in situations that we find ourselves unable to extricate ourselves from either at all or it at great cost, then you think, okay, we're all in a situation where we are going to be, if we're going to move forward, we're going to be backed up against the wall with our own issues and we have to to resolve them. We have to let go of our own grievances so that we can continue to expand. Yes, you're right. It's like she totally, I agree 100% from what he said, that she was definitely in love with him. This kept them together in a way that needed to happen. Yes, so she could experience that specialness and also get back at him for it. With Yes. <laughs> Bob, Bob, come in. It's Bob's about good, time so. because Bob was with Bill, as you'll hear, from the very beginning of when he entered, yeah. and Bob was like Bill's special protege. Yes. Um, yeah, there were a couple of things that haven't been uh, mentioned yet mm-hmm. that if you really want a complete portrait of Bill, just have to be put in there. But before I get to those... I want to say, if you haven't read Carol's book, it is amazing. It is comprehensive. Um, Never forget to laugh. Yes. And, and it's a must read for a report student. So I want to thank you, Carol, for, thank you. for putting that together and assembling it. Had I known what it was going to take when I started, I probably never would have, just like everybody else who starts a project that's theirs to do. Isn't that the way the course works? <laughs> that's yeah. right. Okay. Talk about CIA. It brings us what we need on a need-to-know-only basis. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah. So, yeah, I just wanted to correct. Bill didn't work for the CIA. He was a consultant, and they would bring him in on occasion to evaluate an agent. And the CIA helped to fund the personality assessment system um, work that was part of his uh, work at, uh, at Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center. But... Um, Bill was an inveterate punster. I mean, he was the most brilliant giver of puns that I've ever encountered, a tradition that Tam and I intend to keep going because we're, we're pretty fond of it ourselves. But when, at the end of his life, Bill came to Tiburon and said to Judy and Wit, I am flexible... This was a triple pun, um, mm -hmm. because flexible is one of the polarities on the personality assessment scale that Bill was not. <laughs> <laughs> and, obviously, it's a, flex, break it up, flexi-bill. So he's flexible, <laughs> and he's in this, uh, this polarity, and, and he's achieved what he couldn't have done. You know, he's incorporated... This other end of the scale, I think the other side of it is rigid. Um, and so what he was saying is, you know, this is now what I have gotten to. And I cannot emphasize enough, I mean, what Carol was saying about Bill being able to make sort of an aside with, with his little ear wiggles, um, <laughs> that happened with Helen and Ken in the room, too. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I would sometimes be with him and just watch, you know, he'd sort of look over and the ear would wiggle and you'd know, okay, this is all just one big cosmic joke. <laughs> but, um, but, but, but uh, you know, so the punning is essential. He also uh, worked his process to uncover all the residue of ego to transcend it more committedly and determinedly than anyone I've ever known. Um, and when he said, I'm practicing forgiveness, that was the real deal. That was the real McCoy. And I think as part of that, what, what also hadn't been mentioned yet is that he lived for a number of years with um, Patricia Hopkins, a woman, um, they had a deeply close relationship, and I know from you know talking with her, she's uh, a friend, that, yeah, the sexual piece didn't work. Um, he couldn't make it work. And I think sometimes we go through things where we're trying to achieve a goal uh, that may even seem to be a spiritual goal and may even be guided, uh, but only guided in the sense that it exposes some ego residue that we need to move through and accept about ourselves. And I don't think it's a coincidence that when Bill and Pat Hopkins finally decided that they would go their separate ways, that Bill then very rapidly, soon after that, went down to La Jolla where he could, you know, sit in the Luckett's garden and just be with the course and meditate and, and transcend all day. Um, but so, so I, I, I do think of him, as Judy said, as, you know, the first person to completely do the course. And, and how fitting is that? Absolutely. Um, how fitting is that? So I just wanted to add those, those couple of little I'm, tidbits. I'm glad you did. Yeah. And, you know, when he went down to La Jolla, he was in the company of Jack and Leo Luckett, who were a lot of fun. They went out all the time. So in a way, Bill had a chance to relive, a, you might say, his early teenage years like he didn't get to do it when he was a teenager. You know, they yes. went out, they went to plays, they had fun, and so on and so forth. And another thing that that reminds me of is that Bill was very psychic in his own way, and he was especially amazing at getting tickets to things. He never had, he loved the opera, he loved, he, he was a big classical music fan, and if he never had subscriptions to anything, but he would go, I think we should go to this opera tonight, and so we'll go down and get tickets when the thing is sold out. It didn't matter. Every single time Bill wanted tickets to anything, he always got them. One time he was in New York with Pat, with whom he actually lived a couple of years. Pat's a very good friend of mine. And, and he looked at his watch and he said, it's 2.15, 
It's this was a sold out performance of something they were very excited about. It's two fifteen. I need to go down now. Is the time I can get tickets? Went down to the box office, got the tickets, came <laughs> back. They had this marvelous time. It just happened all the time. Sometime when he was in La Jolla, they were going uh, to the circus. You know, one of the big fancy circuses that had come to town, and someone had given him three tickets. And the, he invited a fourth person to come, and who, who one of the other two said, but you've only got three tickets. And he said, don't worry, the fourth one will be there. So they drive down, park in the parking structure, are walking across whatever way needed to be walked across, and some guy rides up on a bicycle <laughs> out of nowhere and says, Here's a ticket for you. Or the, I mean, it was like, what? And the ticket turned out to be very close to where the other three tickets were. It was like, and I saw this in action myself with things as ridiculous as parking spaces. We took him to the opera in Santa Fe one time, and Santa Fe in the summer, you can't park anywhere close to the square. So as we're driving up and we're a few blocks away, I thought, well, maybe here's where we should start to find a parking place. And he said, no worry, we'll get one right in front. So it's like, well, how unheard of, but we did anyway. And sure enough, we drive right up. If you've ever been to Santa Fe, you know, kind of the old part of downtown, we drive up and here is a parking place directly across the street from whatever restaurant we're going to. It's as if that parking space was invisible to everybody else driving around. Here it was for us. I'm sure you watched him do that a lot. Um, yeah, he. I mean, I think that was one of the little perks that he got for us. <laughs> yes. for, he did. for all of his hard work, something had to be easy. <laughs> Jesus perks. But you know, but he never lost his sense of humor. Never. And um, I mean, just as an example of that, in the midst of you know Helen dying and insisting that that Bill and Judy and Jerry call her, uh, eat, you know. They did a, a rotation. Each would call at a certain time on a day. So she's talking to all three of them, uh, you know, several times a day. You know, he would come up with things like, yeah, you know, uh, in describing Helen and her attitude, I am a body. I am six. Someone fetch a doctor quick. You know, <laughs> he could just come up with these. <laughs> and it was a lovely, lovely way of saying, yes, we're all here to learn. Um, there's love, but we never forget to laugh. Absolutely. So thank you, Carol. You bet. I, I, I'll kind of close up my reminiscences and then you come up. He, one of his favorite sayings was, and he would say this, you know, with light in his eyes, he would say, I know it's hopeless, just not serious. <laughs> Good morning, and thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Michael Campbell, and I was the belligerent in the uh, rip the page out of <laughs> okay um, for those of you who don't know his story um, go to the uh, does anyone have a text here yeah okay open up to chapter 18 <laughs> now we're getting into the good detail this is a good I got a whole stuff. bunch of good go back to your course way. groups say let me set this straight here, right? <laughs> I met the belligerent yeah <laughs> 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 Um, I'm going to read the last, it's the third paragraph, because I just happen to know these trivia things. I was with um, my girlfriend, who we were breaking up with, and um, Wayne and Patty Germain, who were uh, students of A Course in Miracles, friends of Bill, and I was at the Tuesday night meeting with my girlfriend, and we were not doing well. So <laughs> that's the context. <laughs> so I, I want to read to you uh, the last line. <clears throat> the body is emphasized with special emphasis on certain parts and used for the standard for comparison of acceptance or rejection 
for an acting out of a specific form of fear. And I said to Patty, oh, Patty, by the way, that's just one of the hundreds of references to sex and A Course in Miracles. And Patty had a meltdown. She just couldn't deal with it because she just, Bill had to be asexual. She had to be asexual. And then the meeting ended, and then the next day Bill called me up and said, oh, Patty called, saying she was really upset about my obsession with sex and A Course in Miracles. <laughs> and he then said to her, well, you know, whenever those issues around sex come up, I just rip those pages out. <laughs> and, and so that was the whole story. And I, he said, well, maybe you should skip for a week or two. So I skipped for a week or two, and then I just kind of decided that if you didn't understand the role of sex in A Course in Miracles, you probably shouldn't be leading a meeting. And you should have at least some sense of humor around it. Mm -hmm. Like Ken Wapnick would say, well, you can either have a sexual starved body or you can have a normal body. So I thought you would just like to know that I was one of the belligerents on that. <laughs> <laughs> and then <clears throat> the second one is PSA, the um, <clears throat> Personality Assessment System. Mm -hmm. I was taking the Myers-Briggs, and I was talking to Bill about that, and then we were talking about the PSA. The PSA was a test that looked at, uh, initially, the Stanford Binet IQ tests, and then the WAS tests, and on about an hour, what they could do is they could determine what you had learned, okay, what you had learned in your life from, about math and science and social studies and things like that, but they also learned some of the other questions. And from that, they developed the scale. So <clears throat> I said to Bill, well, what's that really useful for? And then he looked to me and he said, snipers. <laughs> snipers. <laughs> yeah, and I sat there and I said to myself, he goes, yeah, I was really good at predicting snipers. <laughs> and like I say, there's been like a little whitewashing of Bill that's gone on since his death. But it was, you know, it, it was, he really was one that would, um, tell stories and he would just tell the absolute truth which is the way he felt about sex is he just wanted to rip out all of those pages mm -hmm. so when you read the you know unauthorized versions you'll see all of that sex that's been taken out mm -hmm. but it's really quite interesting he he really didn't like pages that had references to sex <laughs> okay so that's two of my stories thank you <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Oh, I just wanted to come up and um, just see, yeah, David, if you had anything that you felt to share from what Carol's been sharing, um, or if you had anything else that you wanted to ask Carol. Mm -hmm. And then um, also just to mention that this afternoon, Carol felt to possibly be um, available. Just there is this open space this afternoon for two or three hours for siesta or joining. Um, and up here under the shade could be a nice space or possibly in the gathering room where there's AC and it's cooler. So she felt to just be available if there was a small group who just had some more intimate questions to really hear. Not just yeah. about Bill, about anything. Not just about Bill, yeah. but about yeah. Bill. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I think, too, that what Carol started talking about at the very beginning seems to strike me the most, too, is that, that there's a bigger plan, that it's very orchestrated by one who knows our good, that um, from the human perspective, you actually can't... Uh, figure out or any understand anything from the horizontal plane and so the more trusting you can be at just waking up in the morning and saying here we go um, I'm I'm yours Lord or here I am Lord is what mm -hmm. the prayer that uh, mm -hmm. Jesus yes. gave to Bill through Helen I, I really when you think about it even what Carol shared at the beginning here she is 
married, mm-hmm. raising three children in mm-hmm. Denver, and and she this whole thing with Tiburon and the signs and symbols. That's been my experience too. It's all orchestrated. Mm-hmm. We we are only spinning our wheels in the mud when we try to say, I think I know what's going on now in my life, and I think I know what's coming next, and I think I know... Because the relationships, according to the ego, all have boxes and categories, and you're like a living witness and sharing of how this higher power is behind does every, its thing. Does its thing, <laughs> no matter what, and you can try to judge against it or tell it to stop or whatever, and it will have its way. So I just appreciate that, really, that that, that really shines through, because that's, that's really the most important thing for all of us. If you can just take one thing away from this, this whole weekend, that would be huge, just to have that. Well, and that you that everyone is so lovingly and specifically looked after. You know, it's like there's not anybody sort of sitting out there in the wings not being noticed. You know, we we tend because of the way brains work and because of the things we believe that are incorrect that all of us have a very small picture of ourselves comparatively speaking and so the course presents itself as remedial in other words we've dug ourselves into a big hole and now we're trying to get up to you know our heads above water in some way and it just gets down in the hole with us and talks to us as if we were separate people living in a real world in other words if it doesn't talk to us in a way that that relates to where we think we are we would pay no attention to it. There would be no way we could relate to it and hang on to our hands, so to speak, to keep allowing us to be more and more and more aware of what we really are. But what you've said is so true. Everybody has got something that's fabulous, that you love to do, that allows you to be with whoever you want to be with, that allows you to give your gifts in the very best possible way, and no one is left out of that formula, if you want to call it a formula. Nobody. Nobody. Yeah, and I think we can all bear witness to, you know, at the back in in the manual for teachers, clarification of terms, you know, where Jesus says, those who seek for controversy, we'll find it. But this is not a play of ideas. This is a very practical course. He's asking us to apply and practice the course, and Bill was certainly a good witness to that. But to me, once you start to get into stories about versions, stories about what happened, what was taken in, what was taken out, whose fault it was, I think you've just bought into the ego's bait, hook, line, and Amen. sinker. Amen. And so, Amen. hallelujah Amen. for bringing an end and going into that high state of mind where we say, you know, I don't think Jesus makes mistakes. If he's orchestrating time and space, and he's using all the symbols, like, like, uh, like, like leaves blowing in the wind, he just knows all the nuances, he... No, he doesn't miss a thing. He doesn't make mistakes. There were no errors or mistakes with the Course in Miracles. I know that's a pretty radical idea, but uh, because Jesus is orchestrating everything, and that we can actually come together now and be shining examples of of Christ on earth. Let our hands, our lips, everything we do be used for the glory of God. And let's let go of this controversy stuff, because that's just really a dramatic distraction. Absolutely, because it doesn't matter about the container you use to find out about this. The point is, I must let go of my grievances. And it doesn't matter if words are rearranged in one way or the other. We have to let go of the way we're hurting ourselves. Since no one is doing it to us, we are doing it to us. So we're being taken by the hand and it, and shown to us, if we'll pay attention, exactly how I'm hurting myself. My relationships will show me in acute detail how I'm hurting myself, how I get to change my mind, end of story. That's what all of these words are for. 
And as long as that's your goal, as it says, you can take any one lesson. And if you actually practice it, you actually take it to heart. (laughs) 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 She's speaking your words. She took your words. The course is a transcendental catalytic converter to give us an experience. If you can do one lesson, one instant, it's over. Yes. This, this chapter, next chapter, what are you going to do? Yes. You can't back up the car, back up the car, you have to go back to the car. Right, right. You just be there for one instant. Yes. Game over. Yes. Yay. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> did not expect to be up here again, but just to illustrate the point of no mistakes and something greater orchestrating all of this, um, I was going to sneak out to get ready for the next talk, and I can't find my shoes. And all through this, there's somewhere over there, but all through this, I was wondering if I should share as a kind of finale about Bill's presence on Earth, what happened to me with him, which I've never told anyone. I mean, just anyone publicly, which was that morning, July 4th, I had to stop by my mother's because, and I was very busy doing things to get ready for Bill's party later, and I was in my own life, in my own world, very busy. Years earlier, when I was 12 years old, I was leaving my grandparents' house, saying goodbye to my great-grandmother, and I was going off to camp. And I had, I gave my grandmother a hug goodbye, and then I was walking down the stairs, and I heard, go hug her one more time. And I, there was a part of me that was rebellious, because I didn't want one more time to be one last time. So I didn't. I thought, if I don't go, it's fine. And sure enough, she passed that summer, and when I was away, and I had a dream of her, I knew she was going, And so I came to my mother's house to quickly stop and deliver something that she needed. And I was going to come back later for the party for Bill. And my mother said, Bill's here. Come in and uh, say hi to him. And I said, no, no, I'll see him later. And she said, no, just come in and say hi to him. And I said, no, I'll see him later. And I took off. And there was that funny feeling in me. Mm -hmm. And then I got a call about two hours later that he had passed on the street in front of her house and there was a part that felt guilty in me and I thought oh sorry Bill I didn't actually stand the present and take that time I knew why but still I I wasn't I didn't step in in that way and then the next thing I was asked I almost immediately got a call to be asked that during the memorial service for Bill I was supposed to be with his body. Someone had to be with his body and witness his cremation to know that it was him. And what was I given during that witnessing? And it was a very holy moment while everyone was gathering up above and I was there watching his body go in to be incinerated. Um, I was given his shoes to hold. And I was holding his shoes. And so I'm, I'm thinking, should I say this? Should I say this? Should I come up and say this? How something, you can call it Bill's energy of forgiveness, um, Holy Spirit, how, however you want to see it, orchestrated for me to actually have a final goodbye with him. And then me not being able to find my shoes here and keeping me here, keeping me here. It's like, okay, okay. I'll, just the I'll do it. <laughs> Uh, it, it, there are no mistakes. It does work for your own forgiveness of your own self in every possible way. And Bill just illustrated that over and over again. And Bill, could you give me my shoes so I can? <laughs> <laughs> there there they are. Funny. Do, do, do you? Can you tolerate? I mean, everybody, not just you. Can you tolerate about one more story about him? I have no idea what time it is, but but that brings me to. So many people, including myself, have had the sense of Bill being around. He is a real busybody. For all of his (laughs) being um, an introvert when he was alive, I've heard from so many people who have read Never Forget to Laugh. And people will say... I so feel Bill's presence. Now, a lot of these people, most people have never met him, after all. I mean, he died 29 years ago. And, and, and people will call and or write and say, I just cry because I miss him so much. And, and they never met him in the flesh. <laughs> so it's like, but, but the idea of Bill's being around... 
don't take that as just some sort of a weird voodoo thing. Bill's around. Tammy, I feel sure that the fact that you can't find your shoes is not an accident. In other words, <laughs> shoes is a thing. When I have to tell you just a couple of things. When Bill had asked that he be cremated and that he wanted his ashes uh, spread out all over the bay there in San Francisco, and Pat Hopkins was the executrix of his estate. And so she was the one handling all the details. And so the ashes could not be spread immediately because the weather was pretty bad, which meant the water was rough. And those ashes are spread with a very low-flying airplane, and it's dangerous to the airplane under those circumstances. So it had to wait until the conditions were right. Well, on this particular day, which turned out to be a Wednesday, at about 8.30 in the morning, Pat gets a call from the people who say today is the day that the ashes will be spread around noon or something. So she said she's making a tuna fish sandwich for lunch about noon, which was Bill's favorite lunch. And she said as clear as anything, she hears Bill's voice over here saying, this is the punster in him. It's Ash Wednesday, Pat. <laughs> so she called Judy, and they had another good cry over the whole thing. <laughs> it's Ash Wednesday, Pat. So like him. Kind of at the at the other end. I know he was so helpful to so many people when I was debating about writing this book, I, I I look back now and thought, what was the debate? But there was in the beginning. Like, well, maybe this is somebody else's job to do and not mine. And so I had went up to see this lady. There's a town about 30 minutes from where I live called Casadega, which is filled with psychic people and spiritualist camp and so on. It's kind of well known. And so I knew a woman up there. So I said, okay, so I'm going to go up and have this little psychic reading. And somewhere I said, I'm about to write a book about a friend of mine. No more details than that. I said, if you just get anything about that, let me know. And she said, for some reason, I see this typewriter. She said, it's an old-fashioned kind of typewriter where you type and the carriage moves and then you have to return the carriage back. It's like, okay, I got my message. I'm done. <laughs> if there's anything that's associated with Bill, it's the typewriter on which the course was typed in the first place. Then to the other end of, of the spectrum where he was so helpful, I'm positive. Thirteen years ago, my younger brother died of Parkinson's disease and another related uh, disorder, multiple systems atrophy. So he died much faster than one normally does with Parkinson's. And for about a year, for the last couple of years of his life, I promised I would go through his dying process with him. And so I would go up to where he lived. He was a professor at a university, and I traveled back and forth about every six weeks, and we went through all the things in selling his house, moving, all the stuff that had to be done as he deteriorated. And about the last year, I would say, do you want me to read you any spiritual material? And he would say, as best he could talk, kind of like, well, if you want to, and it's like, this hasn't anything to do with whether I want to. It's like, would this be helpful? Would you like to do this? And it would kind of always go nowhere. So obviously the answer was no. And so we fast forward. I was up there at what turned out to be my last visit. And I had also made arrangements ahead of time so that when he was ready to call hospice, I had all the arrangements made. And I would say, do you want me to call hospice? No. He was smart enough to know what calling hospice meant. So he was pushing this off. And so on this occasion, he had been transferred from the assisted living to a nursing home. And I looked at his clothes. And as often happens in nursing homes, if there aren't family members there all the time, the clothes manage to slowly disappear, actually maybe quickly disappear. So I looked in his closet and I thought, I need to go find more of your clothes and bring them here. So I went to this place, which we had rented pretending like he could still work uh, for a big office, but it actually turned out to be a giant storage unit for stuff from his house and his clothes and from his office at the university and so on. A lot of people had helped. Some boxes were marked, some weren't. So it was like walking 
if you've ever gone skiing, you know, where you're down with moguls on both sides of you, it was like just mountains of boxes. So I thought, well, I don't know where I will start. So I just wander through all these hundreds of boxes. I choose a box, open it up, and you know what was inside that box? Books. He had zillions of books. And on the very top of that box was a book of Bill's favorite sayings from the course that he and his friend Jules published as one of the very first things he did when they moved out to Tiburon. That was one of his little kind of get settled into California things. And I had given it to my brother back in 1979 when it was published, and I'm sure he never opened it, but I always gave him all that anyway. And so I picked up this book. I thought, this is so not an accident. Dear Bill is here. Bill is helping with this dying process. So I took it with me. The next day, another good friend of ours from our childhood, I said, if you want to see him, he's going fast. You need to come now. So she had come down from Omaha. So we went to the nursing home, and I said, I, I found this book of, of sayings from A Course in Miracles. I said, would you like for me to read you some of this? And for the first time, he said, he couldn't really talk. What? Yes. So we wheeled him out in a wheelchair into this lovely little kind of garden area. And I said, it's just so touching. And I said, okay, I'm going to just read you a few of these. Don't listen with your intellect. Listen like you were being held in your mother's arms who adored you more than anything. And just listen from there. So I read, you know, there were short little passages and then could kind of look and I could see he was still engaged. So I'd quickly open it almost to any page and read another one. And and he was paying attention. After about 10 minutes, that was kind of as much as he could tolerate. And so we took him back in. I flew home that night. The next day, his extra help that we had hired called and said, he's ready for you to call hospice. So I called hospice. They came in on Friday. She called me and said, your brother's in really bad shape. I said, I know. I was just up there. And so I quickly called his boys in that came in over the weekend and were with him and his ex-wife, who was a saint, and um, the hospice people. And they told people at the university he was kind of a living legend in his field. And all of Monday and Tuesday was a parade of people in to say goodbye to him. And he died early evening of Tuesday. And no one will ever convince me that Bill was not right there holding hands with one of us, taking him finally in the easiest possible way to let go. He was holding on because his younger son was about to graduate from college. So he was trying and trying to accomplish being present for that. He couldn't, of course, go, but the young son, his younger son, was able to be there over that weekend. Bill and what Bill's presence, which of course is all of us, there aren't any boundaries, but all of the help that we all need for anything we go through in our letting go process is here for us if we will ask, if we will pay attention, if we will take advantage of everything that's being handed to us on a silver platter. It's ours to accept. And there were many other things that I don't have time to tell you about, but those are kind of three little things that make it very clear Bill's here. So is everybody else. Mm, thank you. Yay. Thank you.